Hey everybody, it's Mike from Production Crate. I'm in a new place. I haven't really set it up yet, so excuse any weird audio issues and lighting issues. Chris actually sent me a bunch of cool pictures. He built a material scanner while I was gone and he wants me to process it and do material. So I'm gonna show you guys how to do that. Um, these are them right here. And I'm sure he already explained, but these are a really close up sample of a material that he put inside of that crazy box. And uh, each one has light coming from a, a different angle. And just so you know, you don't need a fancy scanner. We just thought it was cool, so we went for it. You can do it with a cell phone if you control the lighting really well. Uh, Substance Sampler is actually able to do this process with a single image. So as you can see that the light, in this case, starts on the right side and it goes around in a counterclockwise sequence. It's really important that the images are in order. It doesn't matter where the light starts or what direction it goes, as long as it goes in order and there's no skips. Uh, he also sent me this one here, which is all the lights turned on. So you get kind of a, a good color map or a diffuse map. And that's actually a good backup in case the program isn't able to handle whatever you're trying to do. How I like to process these images is I open all of them, all eight, and we're gonna crop them and resize them. So in Substance Alchemist, or if you have the Adobe version, it's called Sampler, uh, you can fix any skewed images or distortion or uh, perspective issues. But if you actually have lens distortion where straight lines have been bent, there's no way to fix it in Alchemist. So in that case, you would want to take all the images into Lightroom or something like that and fix any lens distortion. But these images actually came out pretty straight, so we're going to be able to handle this. So what you want to do is just double check that they line up. And anytime you switch between two images here, you can tell the camera didn't shift. That's good. You may want to crop these into a square because they're going to be squished into a square, or you could do that in substance. He set me up for success here. I'm just going to resize them really quick. If you go to image, image size, we want to lower this resolution from 350 pixels per inch to 72. Now notice if I type in 72, it really reduces the size of the image. So I'm going to turn off resample and then turn it back on. I'm also going to go to pixels and I actually don't know if this is totally necessary, but I like to take the smaller dimension and make it a power of two. 3D programs really like textures that are at powers of two. So resize all of your images that way. I've actually already done it and I've saved them out. Okay, so here we are in Substance Sampler, and I need to import those images. So just super simple, just over here on the right side of the screen, go ahead and click on your layers and navigate to your folder where you save these out. Um, I do have this diffuse image that Chris shot for me. On this step, I'm just gonna import those eight light references like this and press open. Now this window is gonna pop up and it's trying to ask you how you wanna use these images. In our case, we're gonna do multi-angle to material and press okay. Ooh, you got a crash. I recovered from the crash. Here's what you get when you import those eight images as multi-angle to material. So notice we get three layers. We get the base material, the image import with eight images in it, and then a multi-angle to material node. So the first thing I like to do once uh, the images get imported is I click into the multi-angle to material and I set these things up here. This is kind of hard to grasp just from looking at the interface. It took me a while to do some research to figure out what it was looking for. But if I click right here, uh, we get our 3D view and our 2D view. What we're telling the computer is in the first image, which angle is the light coming from? And if we look back in Photoshop, in the first one, the way Chris did it, is the lights coming from the far right side of the image. If we go back into Sampler, it's saying which angle is that first light coming from? You might think that the top here, 12 o'clock, is angle zero and then it goes around 360 degrees, but just from trial and error and from doing some research online, it's actually the left side is angle zero for some reason. I don't know why it starts over there. So because our light starts on the right side, the first angle is 180. In our case, it's going counterclockwise around, so I'm gonna set this to counterclockwise. You can actually test this out. If you're not sure what angle it is, you can actually just play with this slider and you can see how it changes your material. Uh, for example, if I go all the way over to angle zero, you can see that it looks like the bumps are going the wrong way. So I'll just set that back to 180. If we look at our material, it actually did a pretty good job. It looks pretty good. Other things we can do here is we can go down into the roughness channel and we can dial this in manually. So if it looks a little too shiny to us, uh, we can increase the position slider and that will dull the whole thing down. And you may notice that uh, parts of this thing are shiny and parts of it are rough. The dirt is rough. And that's the range slider. So it's the difference between the shiniest part and the least shiny part. So if we wanted to make it look like this whole thing was coated in Vaseline or something, we can turn the range all the way down so everything is equally shiny. And then we can turn the position down. And now the whole thing's just super, almost like it's wet. But let's go fix that. I like to increase the range all the way. And let's set our position to about 0.5 or 6. So you might think that we're done, but uh, if we look at it 
It doesn't tile very well. It looks pretty good, but if I tile the image, you'll start to see the seams and, and the issues that we have. So I'm gonna to go to my tiling settings right here, and I'm gonna tile it maybe, I don't know, three by three, and now you can see it doesn't really tile. So there's a couple issues. First of all, the pattern doesn't line up at the seams, but also the whole thing seems to kind of have a bulge, like quilt squares. So we're gonna to try to fix both those issues. First, let's try to fix the pattern so that these little shapes line up. If you go up here to the layer palette and click this new layer right here, we're gonna search for something called perspective transformation. The first thing we wanna do is just make sure all the lines are straight, otherwise it'll be impossible to tile. So if I go here, and start dragging this and stretching it, right? I'm not trying to make this tile perfectly. I just want to make sure all the lines are straight. For example, these shapes here at the bottom, I can see that this one here on the right side, it's not touching the bottom of the image, but as it goes towards the left, these are starting to sink below the bottom of the image. So let's fix that. Just grab this corner, and I'm going to use the border of the image as my guide. Try to raise these up. On the left side, it looks pretty good. And then on the right side, I can see that these ones here are not quite touching the edge. It's okay to crop it a little bit. So I'm just gonna bring these out to the edge and use that as my guide. And if I look over here, again, it doesn't tile any, any better, but now the lines are straight and we can make a tile. So let's go plug in a layer. We'll search for the word tiling. Now the way this one works is it actually does crop the image. You may notice that it's kind of hard to figure out what's happening as I do this because the crop box is moving, but the texture also shifts when I do it. So up here in the top right corner, you can change this to different modes. I'm gonna do layer inputs, and now it makes a little more sense. You can see the image stays still, and we see the result over here in the 3D view. So I'm gonna crop this down, so maybe I'm going right through the middle of this row. And then on the bottom, I can see that these ones are also leaning up and to the left. So I'm gonna crop that in the middle. We can see over here in the 3D view that the pattern is starting to align. Now don't worry about this crunchy line or any artifacts that you see, because we can deal with that later. Now the left side actually looks pretty good already. If yours doesn't line up on the left and the right, uh, just go ahead and move this box around like we did at the top until it looks good. So if I look at, for example, this piece right here, this is actually the, the seam and the overall shape seems to match pretty perfectly. If you zoom in really close though, you can see that the dirt doesn't tile. This tiling filter does, does a pretty good job. It doesn't do straight lines. Uh, it kind of has a zigzaggy line and that helps it mask the seam. But if you look close, you can still see a seam. So we, we need to refine this. Uh, if you're having trouble visualizing the seam or you can't quite find it, um, there's a cool little troubleshooting setting over here on the right. I can turn on show seams and show areas, and now you get this color code that shows how it's blending, which is really easy and uh, really nice. Also in the tiling settings, there's a edge category, and I can increase or decrease the threshold to grow or shrink that edge. I can also increase or decrease the blur to soften the edge. There's also smoothness and grid resolution. What grid resolution does is it changes the size of those crunchy shapes. So if I lower it, I get bigger crunchy shapes, and if I raise it, I get smaller crunchy shapes. So I'm gonna set my grid resolution to like eight. And if you get these artifacts, um, it's just kind of a glitch. All you have to do is just change these settings by maybe like one or two numbers, and they'll go away. Just kind of fiddle with the sliders. Let's increase that blur and the smoothness. Maybe play with the threshold just a little more. I'm trying to get rid of those artifacts. You can also mess with the grid resolution. So our pattern is tiling pretty well now. It's such a powerful program. But now we need to get rid of those uh, overall square shapes. Um, we can still kind of see this quilt pattern that we don't want. So for that, I'm going to use a filter called Equalize. Now you probably get some weird results. See, it actually kind of looks worse. That's because you want the Equalize to be underneath all of your tiling and perspective effects. I'm going to put it right on top of multi-angle to material right there. And that actually does a pretty good job. I don't think I need to change the settings too much. I do see a little bit of those artifacts coming through, so I'll fix that. But what the Equalize does is it takes anything that seems to stand out from the rest of the image and it makes it match. Under the Equalize layer, there's a slider called Radius where you can refine it. So if I turn it up, the effect kind of turns off. If I turn it all the way up. And if I turn it down, it'll become more and more intense. It'll average it more and more until you just have a gray blob. So you don't want to go too low or too high. You can dial this in until it feels right. You can also turn on Keep Local Differences. Turning on Keep Local Differences sort of reduces the threshold for which features it gets rid of. Uh, if you feel like it's erasing too much interesting detail, you can turn Keep Local Differences on and you might get some of it back. It's just trial and error, just whatever looks best for your material. I'm gonna go back to my tiling and see if I can refine it just a little more to get rid of these artifacts. So if I go to the edge, just play around with the threshold maybe until it disappears. There we go. So that's pretty simple, right? It looks like a finished material to me. Let me show you how to add some extra artistic features just in case you want to, and then I'll show you how to export it and finalize it. Clean version's here, it's ready to go, but let's say we wanna add dust to it. Well, you can actually just go to your layers and just search for dust. They have tons of cool filters and um, materials to layer on top. 
So let's go add dust. And you can see it kind of puts dust down in the deep recesses, which is very cool. There's tons of options for blending. I can increase the dust density. If I want more dust, I can lower it. And you can see it starts to pile up so much that it actually fills in the bumps and gets rid of them. It's so cool. Let me delete that dust layer. Let's say you want to go even more extreme and just pile on mud. Well, over here in their material library, you can just start throwing their existing materials on here and make tons of variations. Like here's mud, for example. I'll just drag and drop that on top. And now it looks like there's mud in the cracks, which is so cool. So notice that when you throw a material on the object, there's a special little box on the side. It's called a height blend in this case. If I click that, it's going to allow me to raise the level of dirt. If that doesn't make sense. Let me just show you. It's pretty cool. So if I increase the offset, it's almost as if it's moving up through the height channel and burying our original material. And the last thing to get buried is the highest points. And I can also just kind of lower it to get a little bit of like gravel in there, which is pretty cool. So I encourage you to explore and figure out all the options that they have. They have a huge library of materials, but I just want a clean version. All right, last step is to export our finished material. That's over here on the share button. And you can send it straight to Substance Painter if you're ready to just start using the material on your projects in Substance Painter. But in this case, I wanna make it sort of more universal so I can share it with other people or use it in other programs like Cinema or Blender. So I'm gonna export as, and let's name this. I'm gonna to navigate to where I wanna put it. Finished textures. Now for the format, you have a couple options here. Again, if you want to use this in other Substance programs, like Substance Painter, Substance Designer, I can export an SBS AR, Substance Archive. If you want to just have the raw maps to use in other programs like Blender, then I would export PNGs or TIFFs or JPEGs if you want. But in this case, I'm going to do PNGs, 4K, and just hit export. You'll notice over here in the export queue that it's working. Again, be sure to like and subscribe to make this export faster. All right, it looks like it's done. Some of these maps are blank, we don't need them. For example, there's no transparency, so it's just blank. Um, you can go ahead and trash those maps if you need to. Let's actually test these maps in another program. Here's what the material that I just made looks like in another program. In my case, I like to use Marmoset to test out my materials, but you could use Blender or Unreal or whatever. So it looks pretty good. It looks just exactly the same way we expected. So I hope that uh, gave you guys some ideas. So I encourage you guys to go out there and just start snapping pictures and um, show us what kind of materials you make using Substance. And don't forget to make it awesome.